So I think just, I, I should start off by saying, uh, probably much to Brian's surprise, based on the emails that we tossed around before we got here, I generally agree with what Brian has said. Um, there are a few things that I disagree with. One of the most important things is the, the threat's not two to three years away. The threat is here today. Uh, we, we have already seen it. Uh, we can see open source reports of the Luke and the, Luke and the I think it's the SJ-7, uh, Chinese and Russian aircraft that, or spacecraft that have cozied up very closely uh, to either their own or commercial satellites. Intelsat, for example, uh, is where the Russian target was. Uh, these are demonstrations for abilities that we know could be used against uh, U.S. commercial and national security assets. And that's an important point, is that this is not just a national security issue from a military perspective. This is a national security from an economic uh, perspective. Um, I, the other thing I, I want to directly uh, talk about with respect to Brian's statement is that um, I, I, what that really means is that Pearl Harbor is, a, is a, an interesting question. But we're already in the midst of a, an environment where uh, we should know that, that we have imminent threats and must respond to those imminent threats. Uh, I, I, I'm not convinced that an arms control treaty is, is ultimately going to be, uh, having worked with some of the arms control discussions uh, in space, or at least been a part of the UN conventions who are discussing some of those. I've seen the Russians and the Chinese try to um, slow things down and, and distract things, uh, and, and I don't think that that frankly we'll find any great uh, constructive progress in the near term on those things. So I think the policy that must happen, it's not just the national security policy or the national space policy or what General Hyten or General Raymond say, uh, it, it, is, it is a unilateral statement that we will set up these exclusionary zones or these buffer zones. Uh, and, and, and as Henry said early on, this is not a new concept. This is something that's been around for some time. So why hasn't it worked today or up until today? I think it's because it didn't have to work up until today. There was no perceived threat. Uh, and, and with the advent of some of the LEO constellations of uh, megasats, both potentially government with the concept of blackjack, if you've heard of that, uh, and then the OneWebs, the SpaceXs, the Facebooks, the, in fact, we did a, my company did a little analysis that if everyone's successful, which they won't be, uh, over the next 10 years launching the, the commercial only constellations will have about 21,000 satellites up in space that don't already exist there today. Um, so, so what do we do in, and in the policy world, uh, how do we start to have that conversation? And I think if we were um, to look at the UN uh, Convention on uh, Law of the Sea Treaty, we would find, uh, I think, a great framework to begin this discussion. Um, and what I'm again proposing is, is an exclusionary zone that would be a safe space or a bubble in which an asset, uh, a space asset, uh, could, could control and manage that space around them. Almost like we say in the UN uh, Convention for Law of the Sea Treaty, uh, territorial waters, where we own that little piece of space around us in a sphere. Um, and anyone that comes through it must get some sort of permission uh, if they're seen to be, and they have the right to innocent passage through that, that's a term of art, innocent passage, uh, but if they are seen to have some weapon or um, uh, some malicious intent or, they, or there's some report that they were in the open seas and, and also carrying out malicious attempt, attempt uh, against a, another satellite, uh, meaning they were outside of that exclusionary zone, we can begin to uh, uh, take a preemptive uh, strike against them, or to, or some other. I mean, there's a whole series of diplomatic measures that would, that would, um, that would begin before we took a preemptive strike. But we would go through this normal process that we already have established as a, as a normative uh, construct for how we deal with protecting assets in a in a domain like space or sea. Um, and so, just to point to some specifics. Uh, there are six key articles, I think, that, that exist in the Law of the Sea Treaty that, again, we have not, uh, the U.S., ratified, but we generally follow. Um, and 158 other nations have already ratified and also follow. Uh, Article 17 is that right to innocent passage. That is, again, uh, that, that anyone, and I am, this is sort of a pacifist view, everyone should have the ability to pass through space. They should be able to, to seek economic gain. Uh, they should they should uh, not be um, 
uh, deterred from, from sending things into space and, and operating in space. Uh, and, and there is a safe distance, and there is even uh, innocent activity within that safe distance that, that we can manage uh, on a bilateral basis. Uh, so, so that kind of innocent passage should exist also in space. Um, Article 18 goes on to describe what that innocent passage means a little bit more, but it, it, it clearly says it should be continuous and expeditious, which means there's no stopping, there's no lingering around, there's no kind of, you know, delaying, or it's you're coming through and you're getting through, and that's how we know that this is in part innocent passage. You have no intent to, you know, there's no reason for you to hang out by my satellite, frankly. So, uh, so again, another example of, of um, terms of art that already exist today that we can begin to talk about at the policy level. Um, Article 19, uh, the, which is a, a further discussion of the meaning of, of, of what it's not to be for innocent passage, which means there is some threat uh, against, the, against the security of that asset. We've seen the use of weapon either inside the bubble or outside of the bubble from that asset. Uh, and it goes even so far as to say uh, the act of collecting information that could be used against the security of that asset is also deemed to not be innocent. Uh, I don't know if, if the policy should go that far, and because we talk about space situational awareness often. Uh, the, the real question is, should a co-orbital asset be doing uh, space situation awareness against uh, another country's uh, asset? Article 21 talks about the laws and regulations of the owning state uh, related to innocent passage. That means we must grant safety of navigation. We must also promote safety of navigation. And these, uh, well, something I didn't, I didn't hit hard enough in the beginning because I skipped over the, my preamble is that the real framework for this is about safety. It's about um, it's about continuity of operations for both government and commercial assets. And that is the intent uh, of, of the law of, of the sea, and it should also be the intent of any future uh, policy statement by the U.S. and hopefully some multinational agreement eventually on how we conduct ourselves in space and how these co-orbital threats, the, if you read um, Brian's paper, the, he calls them the stalkers, uh, how stalkers should operate uh, as they co-mingle with, with uh, peaceful assets. Article 24 also talks about the requirement for the owning state to register those assets, uh, an important thing. Uh, if, if it is, you know, most pirate ships out in the open sea don't register. They, they don't do all the, the important uh, filing of, of their travel plans. Uh, it's not clear where they're going. It's not clear who owns them. Uh, it, that is a, if, it, if we have the same similar uh, situation in space, then we should suspect that that may not be uh, an asset that intends to conduct innocent passage. Um, and the last one is uh, Article 25, which is probably the most important one and gets to the main point of, of Brian's uh, paper about, about potentially at the end of a series of diplomatic maneuvers, um, the, the right of protection uh, of the owning state. And what that means is, as it says in Article 25, of the Law of the Sea Treaty by any, any steps necessary to prevent passage of that, of that asset that comes through your bubble uh, that, that is deemed not to, to be conducting innocent passage, which means uh, there are a number of, of things that, that a, a state who feels threatened should be allowed to do. Uh, and, and that becomes a method of deterrence, at least at the tactical, at least at the micro level. Um, so again, this is not a new problem. This is something that, that Henry has said. You know, he's, he is a bit of a spring chicken, but his, his professor who has been around for some time has talked about this for, for quite some time. Yes, yes. Uh, so so the, the, what I'd like to leave you with is that uh, in general, I agree with Brian. There's some things that, that in communicating this and, and in structuring the debate that I would propose uh, that we do differently. But by and large, I think uh, Brian's policy proposal of preemptive action uh, is a good one to begin discussing.